One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. That is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to AmericanWarning2022.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, www.americanwarning2022.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's August 23rd, 2022, a beautiful Tuesday down here in Nicaragua. Got a big show coming up. We're going to talk about the markets. We've had a bit of a pullback, but I have some charts I want to show you. These are long-term charts that indicate what's going to happen later this week. Could be setting up for what could be a really nice market rally. And later this week, what I'm referring to is Jackson Hole. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell speaking Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. We'll talk about that what it means for the markets, what the charts are telling us, and then seven stocks you're asking about on Twitter. I will dive into each and give you my views on them. All this coming up right now on Making Money. Again, welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's August 23rd, 2022. Down here in Nicaragua, again, as you could probably see by the background, I will say, if I look a little tired, it's because I am. And unfortunately, it's not because I drank too many Tonyas, which is a local beer, of Florida Cana, which is local rum. Uh, it's because I think I've been pretty damn sick for the last couple of days. But we're going to chug through this, <clears throat> and I might have a couple of times of a stop and cough, uh, take a sip of my tea, but we're going to power through this, and uh, we're going to get in, because this is an important day. Uh, this, this show is important because... The market pullback that we've seen over the last week or so, you know, last week broke the four-week winning streak in the S&P 500, uh, which that's not a big deal because you don't go up every week. That's, that's pretty normal in my opinion. But we're starting to see a lot of negativity come back into the markets. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that a lot of the big money uh, and, you know, retail investors like you and I are starting to be concerned about what the Fed's going to do at their meeting in September. Well, this Friday... We will have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve Chairman. He'll be speaking at 10 a.m. Eastern Time live from Jackson Hole. And this is a, the annual event that the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, they put on. They call it their annual economic symposium uh, in Jackson Hole. And uh, when Jerome Powell speaks, the world, or at least the investment world, will stop and listen. He's expected, obviously, to discuss the economy. With those comments will be obviously uh, something uh, that leans towards to what he is anticipating will happen at the September meeting. Will there be a continued very hawkish, which means that more aggressive uh, take against inflation? And will they raise interest rates 75 basis points as they've done the last two meetings? Or will they kind of turn it back a little bit to 50 basis points? And the concern right now is with both, you know, most big money, as I'm about to show you in a couple of charts, is that the, the the Fed is going to be hawkish. They'll be aggressive. And they really want to knock inflation down and, and hold it down. And I see no problem with that. Uh, the only thing is it's really tending to spook the market right now. So let me show you a couple of charts to show you just how the Fed uh, is affecting hedge funds and how they are setting up based off really just that. Um, let's take a look at the first chart here. This is a chart of the S&P 500 futures. And it's the net positioning that the hedge funds have right now. So if you're at zero, which is, uh, you can see there on, on the right-hand side, just above that red line, uh, zero means that they're net flat, meaning there's certain hedge funds that are long, meaning they're bullish on the market, and certain hedge funds that are short, meaning they're bearish on the market. Right now, we are net short, as you can see, the lowest level that we've seen since June of 2020. We know what happened in June of 2020. It was right after 
COVID really started kicking off. So, of course, uh, we had a big dive in long positions at that point. But also around that time was the start of a big rally. We're seeing the same thing now. We are basically net short almost the same level that we were post-COVID. It says, it, and you take that away, folks. We are the lowest short that we've seen since 2011. You're going back over a decade. So this tells me right now that the hedge funds are positioned for the worst. So come Friday, if the Fed, uh, specifically Jerome Powell, is not overly hawkish, overly aggressive in his speak when it comes to inflation, the market could have a massive rally because there's so many shorts out there. Even if he is hawkish, I think a lot of it's priced in, and I think a lot of hedge funds might be buy the rumor, sell the news type trade, where they might be covering anyway. And keep in mind, these shorts have to be covered. And when they are covered, it means you have to buy back. So if you're short and you want to close out your position, you're a buyer. You put that on top of buyers out there already, if the market turns around a little bit in the near term, you have buyers upon buyers, which leads to a short covering rally, which could something we could easily see. Again, this bottomed out in June of 2020, we know what happened to the market the months after that. One of the biggest rallies we've seen in such a short time period post-COVID bottom. I'm not calling for a rally of that magnitude, folks, but I am calling for something right now that between now and the Fed meeting September, we're going to have some type of short covering in the S&P 500, which is going to lead to a massive rally. Just keep that in mind. So some other positioning that we're seeing here uh, with, the, with uh, the hedge funds, which I think is important as well, we can take a look here at the U.S. dollar. Uh, they are uh, really going long the U.S. dollar right now, again, in fears uh, of, of the fact that something could be happening uh, with the Fed and that interest rates will go up much faster than even the market's expecting, because that should send the U.S. dollar higher as uh, more people will be putting money into U.S. treasuries and more money into U.S. because they're offering higher interest rates. So that makes sense. So, again, this kind of goes in line with the S&P I was just talking about. And then the, right here, we take a look at the 10-year U.S. Treasury futures position. Again, for the hedge funds, uh, lowest since March. So, you know, look about six months or so. And um, again, uh, people are short. And when you're short treasuries, that means you think interest rates will go up. So we can see where hedge funds and big money is positioned right now. The last chart I'm going to show you to kind of circle this all around. This goes back to the S&P 500 and the short um, net short that we have in the S&P 500 futures. You can see here, last time this happened was, as I mentioned, June 2020. The market bottom about two months prior had a huge rally. Let's go here. Right here we are. Then you go back two months ago, about a month or so ago, the market bottom. We've had a rally so far. So to me, we're setting up uh, for a potential of, again, a big rally. I don't think it's going to be anything near the magnitude that we saw, folks, when, when we saw that rally post-COVID. That was kind of a once-in-a-lifetime thing, hopefully once in a lifetime thing. I don't deal with this COVID anymore. Um, so I don't see it being that 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 strong. Uh, all that being said, uh, the numbers indicate that we are setting up uh, for a rally because we've priced in such horrible news. And I just don't, I don't see it happening. And, and again, there's a lot of people that argue with me that think the world's going to end and, and fine. You could think the world's going to end and be miserable every day and, and you know, bitch and moan. That's fine. Uh, just don't, don't bitch and moan around me because I'll walk away. Um, and again, I'm not I'm not looking through rose colored glasses here, folks. I see stocks and I see companies that are still strong. I see economy that is not the strongest. No, it's not at all. But it's in a good enough position and companies are in a good enough position to continue this rally in the stock market. And over the next few years, a uh, pl few plus years, uh, the innovation that's going to be taking place and everything from healthcare to technology to manufacturing is going to change the world. And I want to invest in the companies that are changing the world. So that's where I stand right now in the markets uh, from day to day. I don't know. Uh, Friday is going to be wild. I, I can imagine uh, when he starts speaking around 10 o'clock. So 30 minutes into the market, uh, most people are back from summer vacation. So there's a lot more money sloshing around now. So we will see the markets move. So it's something we want to keep an eye on. And I will update you on Tuesday's show. Uh, just give you an indication real quick for Thursday's show. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary, and one of his business partners coming on. Uh, so uh, make sure you tune in for that. We'll be talking the markets, cryptos, you name it. A little bit of Web3. Uh, really great discussion coming up uh, on Thursday's show here on Making Money. So as I mentioned, I also wanted to dive in a little bit 
uh, to some stocks. You know, every once in a while, I'll pose some questions here on Facebook and, you know, I, I, or not Facebook, sorry, on Twitter. I don't even have Facebook, folks, so don't look for me there. Uh, on Twitter, you know, just asking for specific stocks people want me to look into. And I, I have no axe to grind. I just pick them and I take a look at them. Uh, but let's go through a couple and, and I'll give you an indication of kind of what I feel. I feel like it's, it's, it's nice to do from time to time. I used to have a radio show back in the day and we used to do this and it was always fun. And um, I will tell you, I'm doing these without prior research. I just took these and I'm looking at these because I like to do it kind of off the cuff and look at it with you. Uh, so the first one is symbol DCFC. And this is uh, Tritium DCFC Limited. Uh, this is a company that went public uh, via SPAC not too long ago. And it's in the uh, battery space, so kind of the future of, of, of energy. Uh, this is a company that I, I did some research into it when it first came out, uh, but I haven't really kind of followed it as much. There's a lot of battery companies out there right now. Some are actually doing really well, believe it or not, uh, in holding up. Others tend to lag, and that's what's going to happen. When you have a whole bunch of companies in one specific niche area go public, not all are going to perform. <clears throat> Excuse me. So DCFC has about a market cap just under $1 billion. The stock's up big today, up about 13% in early trading. A uh, big reason for that is they actually had some news today. So maybe that's why the uh, uh, Twitter follower asked about it. They announced uh, the uh, and celebrated the opening of its first global electric vehicle fast charge manufacturing facility in the United States. Uh, this is in Tennessee. And you know, this, is, this is good news, uh, not only because it's U.S.-based, but it's going to employ more than 500 people uh, over the next five years, um, helping build out the EV charging infrastructure. You know, obviously, the U.S. Uh, government's big behind this. Uh, they're looking to basically electrify, electrify transportation across the, the America. And this is, this is really great. It's going to be producing initially its RTM fast charger. So that's what we need for these electric vehicles to really take off. Uh, so this is a, a really interesting company to me. And, you know, up big on that news. I look at the financials. Though, as I mentioned, it's about a billion-dollar company. So last year, it did about $81 million in sales. This year, looking for 157. Next year, 307. So it's got really nice upside growth. Obviously, it's like basically doubling every year. That's that's huge growth on the upside. Uh, bottom line, it's expected to turn a profit next year, folks. And what do I always say for these small cap companies, especially high growth in niche areas? You need to have a path to profitability. DCFC has a path to profitability. Its first plant is open. I mean, this is really, this is big news. You know, the more and more that I look at this, I'm liking this more and more now. So something to keep an eye on here. Uh, that, that we'll keep an eye on this stock. And I'd say put this one on your watch list. And thanks for asking about that stock. The next one is uh, ASTS, uh, another pretty niche company, if I have to say. Uh, ASTS is AST Space Mobile. And this is the kind of company that you think, okay, space is the future, yes. But how far down the line in the future is this? Is this something that's going to be real tomorrow, the next day? Or 20 years from now. So this is a company that's about a $640 million company. But what I like about this, this isn't all about putting people in space and putting Elon Musk on Mars. It's a satellite designer. And there's more and more satellites out there right now. They're building a global cellular broadband network. And if you think about that, how important is that? Because there's a lot of rural areas, not as much in the States, but there are rural areas that you can't get high-speed internet yet. But what about sub-Saharan Africa and other areas around the world? where people don't have access to that. And, and that, that is very big. And there's a lot of companies out there doing it, uh, but they are one of them. As I mentioned, about a $640 million company. Uh, we take a look at the financials. Obviously, we want to make sure they're looking strong. Not a lot of revenue coming in, and that's a big concern. Last year, $12 million. This year, looking for thirteen and a half. Next year, looking for $7 million. Obviously, losing money at that. No path of profitability right now. So that is a concern. Even though I love the business plan, I love the business model. I like what they're doing. All that being said, it doesn't match up with what I want to see as far as the fundamentals. And a lot of times you, you have to kind of take away the, you know, the, the kind of infatuation you have with a stock and its story. All that being said, let's look at the, look at a chart here real quick. It's a nice looking chart. It just broke out. It's consolidating. The chart looks good. It's got big volume coming in. All that looks good. But again, the fundamentals tell me the price doesn't match the fundamentals, at least not for a couple of years, that you're going to have a wild ride. And I think there's other stocks that are better than that wild ride. Uh, the next one is a lithium play, Sigma Lithium. And uh, as I'll show you in a minute here, it's got one of the best charts in the market right now. And we all know lithium, obviously, lithium ion batteries. Um, it's still going to be the battery of choice for the you know foreseeable future. Sure, solid state around the corner and a couple others. 
It's a $2.4 billion company. And, you know, their goal, obviously, is to, to basically power the next generation of electric vehicle batteries. Um, <clears throat> they have high purity lithium that they work on. Uh, they have a, a project in Brazil. It's one of the uh, largest and highest grade uh, rock, uh, hard rock lithium deposits in all the Americas. Um, what's crazy about this is that it's committed. They say they're committed to a strong ESG uh, practices and aim to be net zero emissions by 2024. That's pretty. That's pretty wild. It's green friendly processing plant, 100% renewable energy, 100% recycled water, 100% dry stack tailings, which makes it basically good for the environment, or at least not bad for the environment. Um, it might be one reason this has been outperforming some of the other lithium stocks. Uh, you look at the financials and no revenue projected right now. It's still in the in the early stages, which is a concern, obviously. Um, that being said, the, the numbers are a bit wonky here. So, you know, I look at just a chart on this one. Look at the chart here. It hit an intraday high today um, around 23 and change. And it was at eight bucks back in September. So it's already up about 4x. Uh, sorry, 3x uh, since September. So I don't know if I would chase it here, folks, but it is one I put on my watch list. And lithium is going to be around, even though I believe in a lot of other uh, battery technologies, innovations coming, it's going to be around. So at this point, you don't want to ignore that. The next one is a uh, big question here, uh, is a big stock, I should say, is Coinbase. And this is really the leader uh, in cryptocurrencies as far as uh, exchanges are concerned. The stock's been all over the place. A lot of it has to do recently with the, the price performance of Bitcoin itself. You know, not this past week and weekend prior, uh, Bitcoin is above 25,000 for a couple of minutes, it seems like, trying to break out. And then it fell down, down to 20,000 this past weekend, We're around 21,000 and change right now. I'll dive more into Bitcoin uh, on Thursday with Kevin O'Leary, because obviously he's a big proponent of it, and like get his view on it uh, and, and go from there. But, you know, I look at, I look at Coinbase and it's about a $16.5 billion company. And I believe in, in Bitcoin and I believe in cryptocurrencies. And if I believe in that, I have to like Coinbase. It just makes sense. Uh, you take a look at the numbers. Uh, it, they had a big spike in, in revenue last year, uh, dipping this year, but then nice growth over the next couple of years when it comes to Coinbase. Uh, losing money for the next couple of years, again, a bit of a concern. However, uh, this is a stock I think if you can put it away, close your eyes, uh, I think you'll be really happy in about five years from now. Uh, it's been trading between a low of 50 and about 100. It's at 73 right now in the middle of range. If you could buy this close to 50, I think this is this is the type of stock that could do really, really well, uh, again, over the long term. But you must be patient with, with the stock. Big name here. This is Deer, D-E. Uh, stock's breaking out today to a, a multi-month high of about 2%. It's had some good volume coming into it as of late. You know, Deer to me, and I say this a lot, people think I'm crazy because they think of like the old John Deer riding tractors, which is true. Um, you know, it's the world's leader when it comes to agricultural equipment as well. They are, it's, it's a futuristic company. It, it's, it's based on innovation. They use artificial intelligence and all types of robotics and computerization um, to be able to build the next generation of these uh, agricultural uh, machinery. And again, a lot of them electrified, a lot of them self-driving. It's pretty amazing. Uh, you don't see huge revenue growth for a company like this, uh, but that's normal when it's this big. Uh, but it's making a ton of money. You know, it's uh, it trades at a forward P ratio of 14, forward price to sales 2.2, peg ratio 1.1. And as I mentioned, it just broke out here in the chart. So that's obviously a very good sign as well. So uh, this is one, again, this is a nice core holding for me. This is one I'd always put on my list. And then we'll do one more. This is on semiconductor symbol ON, which believe it or not, hit an all-time high uh, just uh, last week, pulling back a little bit. This is a stock that I recommended uh, many years ago at, at an old uh, newsletter that I had. And this company, to me, I, I always loved it because it's, it's the second largest uh, power chip maker in the world uh, and the largest supplier of image sensors to the automotive market. This is all about semiconductors and sensors. And the future of automotives and them being a leader in this is all about semiconductors and sensors, whether it be electric vehicles, whether it be autonomous vehicles, so many more semiconductors, so many more sensors, folks. This is a leader in there. And you just want to go with the leader sometimes. That's about a, just under a $31 billion company. Um, but, you know, you don't see big sales growth the next couple of years. It's right around, just over $8 billion uh, in revenue. So it's not the most attractive as far as uh, the financials are concerned. Uh, but, you know, you take a look at the bottom line and it's estimated to make 
about five bucks a share this year, and but it's going to stay that way for a couple of years. But even at that, you're trading at at, at a pretty um, impressive PE ratio at 14.4, peg ratio of low one, price to sales 3.6. So the numbers are still good, even though it's not growing that much. But I think those numbers are definitely uh, under uh, they're underestimating the potential upside of this company. And as as I said, we showed you a chart here a second ago. You know, on semiconductor at an all time high, there's something going on. This could, this could be the next, I don't want to say NVIDIA because NVIDIA is in a lot of different things, but this could be the next $100, $200 billion company in semiconductor space by the end of the roaring 2020s. And it would not be surprised me at all. From 30 to $200 billion, I think it could, it could be done. And that's about a seven bagger in the next eight years or so. All right, folks. So that's where we stand right now. Uh, we have uh, the markets uh, getting ready for Friday. We probably won't see big movement until then. Uh, but I expect Friday morning to be pretty damn wild. Uh, and again, we'll cover that uh, with our annual or daily uh, insights that we put out uh, every day. The market's open. We'll deal with that on Friday. We'll give you our thoughts on that. And then Tuesday show, we will obviously dive into that and the reaction of the market over the couple of days after that speech from uh, Jerome Powell on Friday from Jackson Hole. And then again, Thursday, don't forget, coming up in two days, we have Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank coming on. And we'll be discussing everything from the markets to crypto and whatever else comes up in between. So again, folks, thank you so much for listening and watching. I apologize for the little cold, but I'm trying to get through this and uh, we will be back and healthy, ready to go Thursday with Mr. Wonderful. Until then, have a great week. I'm Matt McCall and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.